region. We now welcome to studio Ruth Wasserman Landy, a columnist on Arab affairs at the Ma'arev newspaper. Ruth, thank you so much for being here it's my in pleasure. the studio. So Good it evening. all feels a little bit cloak and dagger, the secrecy of a trip, a leak, admissions that happened, then denials. Break down for us, why is this all shrouded in mystery right now? Saudi Arabia is the most important, I would say, um, actor in the Arab Muslim world, of course, the Sunni side of the uh, Arab Muslim world, and as such, has, I would say, even more responsibility in terms of uh, when and how it normalizes relations and accepts Israel. Uh, it's no secret that it has been wanting to normalize relations, but not quite yet. And we see that the actual leak led to the denial amidst the uh, Saudi uh, leadership. And the question is, uh, when exactly will be the moment that this will be uh, made kosher, if you wish? Um, you said something about the Sudanese, which I allow myself to comment on. I wouldn't call it a normalization agreement, rather it is a clearly security-oriented uh, method by the Sudanese to gain economic and security acceptance by the United States back into the international arena after having been put for a rather long time on the uh, terrorist um, supporting countries list. And this has been a huge, I would say, candy for Sudan. Uh, with which to lure it to recognize Israel rather than to normalize relations. It will take a very, very long time. I even believe that Saudi Arabia may step forward before full normalization will happen between Israel and Sudan. As you say, it's a far more complicated relationship Very than with so. Bahrain and the UAE. Of but course. Ruth, talk to us a bit more about the candy. Give us an idea what role has Saudi Arabia played behind the scenes uh, in terms of the normalization deals that we do know about right now? I would say very clearly that had there not been a Saudi green light, definitely Bahrain would not have signed uh, a normalization deal, and this is indeed a normalization deal. Uh, the UAE has a separate, I would say, autonomous uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel, vis-a-vis -vis the international arena, and yet the green light from Saudi Arabia was definitely given. Uh, there is a Saudi backing, there is a Saudi interest, there is a very strong alliance amid the Gulf states in general, the UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt and Jordan aligning interest against the Shiite Iran-led axis, if you wish. And this is a huge strategic issue which is guiding those countries and Saudi Arabia in cooperating with Israel, without a doubt. Now, to that exact point, so much was made by Donald Trump himself about the next nations that were going to follow yes. suit. What do you make of a Biden-Harris administration? What does this mean for future normalization deals? Is it good news, bad news, or won't it make a difference? Your thoughts? To my humble analysis, I would say that there's no turning back. What has been done is not to be uh, reversed. Um, I view the UAE and the Bahraini, especially the UAE, I would say, breakdown of the complete no vis-a-vis -vis Israel and anything to do with it, taking it out of the closet and making it a legitimate uh, partner with which to discuss economic ties, uh, security ties, anything, is something that cannot be reversed. I would even compare it to the breaking of the Berlin Wall. And now that it has been done, there's no turning back because the UAE, it's a matter of honor. It's a matter of respect. They've taken the step. There's no turning back and saying to the people, we've actually made a mistake. We are, we are not really going to do it. And not only are they going to go forward with this deal, the UAE and its leader made very clear that everything they do will be number one. If you read the, the, the books written by the leader, they want to be number one. And even in this normalization deal and the peace, they will set the tone. They will be the role models, they will lead the way, they will show what real peace looks like. And they've been beginning with this trend 
in all fields, slowly but surely. In my humble opinion, just to summarize, there's no turning back no matter who is in Washington, D.C. Well, while we're talking about developments in the region, Ruth, stay with us because another sure. developing story here, Egyptian celebrity Mohammed Ramadan has come under more fire in his home country after images were posted of him embracing Israeli singer Omar Adam during a visit to the UAE. There was a quick backlash on Twitter with many in Egypt saying the actor should not be fraternizing with an Israeli. He was also pictured on the same night with Israeli football star Dia Sabah and an Israeli reality television personality and now the 19 year old has been summoned to an urgent hearing in a Cairo court he will be charged with harming the Egyptian people well Ruth <laughs> tell us your thoughts this really is quite unbelievable quite unbelievable and yet very believable in fact I spent three years in Cairo as an Israeli diplomat and uh, I must say um, although I have a huge huge love for Egypt and I learned a lot uh, normalization is not quite the way to describe the 40 year old peace mm -hmm. between Israel and Egypt uh, there are excellent strategic relations between the leaderships security oriented even economic but not uh, the people to people the real glue that actually binds the nations together and uh, there is a huge taboo a huge and deeply ingrained taboo amidst the people vis-a-vis -vis anything to do with tatbia, with normalization. And uh, on the one hand, I don't believe that Ramadan uh, did not know that it is a taboo. So having taken one photograph with the right. singer and another with a football player, the football player being an Arab Israeli and yet you know, in Egypt, they are viewed as a kind of traitors. Arab Tamanyu Arba'in are not accepted. It's not that he didn't know, and yet he did it anyway. And I believe that this is a kind of a test, a test, a, a latmus test, if you wish, for the people to try and begin a little bit, a drop by drop, to test out the normalization, it's not working very well and it'll take a long, long time because the situation in Egypt is very far from what it is in the UAE. Normalization is still far away. Given the amount of time you've spent in Egypt, would you say that there's a disparity, for want of a better way of putting it, between the youth and the older generation when it comes to acknowledging Israel and a warming of ties, a genuine cultural warming of ties? You know, I wouldn't quite say that it's a generational issue. It's not an issue of uh, older people and younger people, but rather the old God mm -hmm. and a new potential to educate the new generations. And that's in the hands of the leadership. But the re-education takes time not only in the school books, not only in the newspapers. I was there uh, at a time when there was full cooperation, security-oriented, policy-oriented, amidst the leadership, no normalization, to the point that the ambassador and I went to the Minister of Culture, and he told us you cannot even bring an author, an Israeli author, to Cairo until the 67 borders are returned. And you know, it was that uh, sensitive an issue. And yet, if you re-educate, and that takes strategy and time, 20 years, a generation, it can be done. And I believe there is a wish for it to be done, but it's not there yet amidst the people, not only the young ones, some of the old ones as well. Very briefly, closing point. Are you optimistic for the region and Israel's prospects in the region down the line? Briefly? De definitely, definitely. I believe that this is a game-changing transition and more will come. Ruth Fasserman Landy, what a pleasure hearing all your insights. Likewise. A columnist on the Arab affairs at the Marib newspaper. We so appreciate you, you being here in studio. Thank